Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Magnolia Methodist where we are rooted in God's grace. It's good to see everyone here in person and to those online, welcome, good morning. Uh, it's good to be in worship with everyone this morning. Uh, end of the year, we don't have any real announcements except for we're going to begin our stewardship campaign in just a couple of weeks. This is the third day of Christmas, so I think that's three French hens, if I am recalling correctly. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to celebrate Epiphany, and then the following Sunday, we're going to start our stewardship campaign, where we look to turn the page on 2020 uh, and look toward a bright future for 2021 and beyond. And so that'll start next uh, in two Sundays. Uh, there'll be plenty of more announcements about what is going on in the start of the new year and everything we're going to begin as we look forward to a new year uh, in the coming weeks. So keep an eye on your email uh, and on the website as we continue to update that. It's so good to have everyone here this morning. We have Caleb, we have Michelle, and Miss Nancy here to lead us in worship this morning. But before we begin, let us open with prayer. Will you pray with me this morning? Father Almighty, thank you. Thank you for this time for us to gather together to worship in person or online and know that by your spirit we are one. We ask that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit in the hearts and homes of everyone who is joining us online. God, we know that you, by your spirit, no distance is too great, that we are one church. Be with us this morning as we sing songs of praise, as we read your word and we hear it preached. Let us pause for just a moment to consider what Christmas means. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your mask, if you know the words to the songs, I invite you to sing quietly behind your mask. If you're at home, of course, sing as loud as you want. Let us worship God together this morning.
Amen. This time we have the opportunity to come before God with our praise and with our prayers. As always, let's continue to pray for our community, for our state, for our nation, and for our world still gripped by a pandemic. Already in places around our nation, they are running out of hospital beds, uh, which is only going to make things worse. Let's pray for the doctors and the nurses on the front lines of this. Let's pray for families who are uh, worried about a loved one who is sick. For those who celebrated their first Christmas with an empty seat due to loss. Let's give thanks, however, that there are vaccines being distributed and hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel is growing brighter. There was a calculator. I went online. I'm like the 84th like, in line out of 100 people waiting for a vaccine. Uh, I'm at the end of the line. Uh, I pray, though, that people get vaccinated and we can get out of this thing sooner rather than later. Let's pray for those who are facing diagnoses that uh, in light of everything else going on seem somewhat ordinary, but are still serious. For those struggling with health concerns, let's continue to pray for them. Let's get to, but we also have so much to be thankful for in the middle of all this. For life, for health, for daily provision, for our friends and family that we can see and we can Zoom with, I hate that word, but we can Zoom with them and see them and wave at them and know that we're not alone. Even in the midst when things seem dark, there's still light, which is the message of Christmas. As I go to God in prayer to lift up our prayer concerns, I invite you to as well lift up your prayer concerns to God, but also to give thanks for every blessing in your life. Will you pray with me? Father Almighty, thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity to gather together with our friends and with our family and to worship you. God, you know our needs before we do and better than we do. But we ask that you hear our prayers this morning. Our prayers for a world gripped by this virus with all the uncertainty that it has brought, all the mourning and all the grief. God, be with those who are sick be with those who are tired. Be with those who are grieving. We ask that you be with those who are filled with uncertainty at what comes next and what is the right path forward and how to put food on the table and to keep a roof over their heads. And God, use our church. Show us how we may be of service, how we can help those who are in need. We ask that you be with all of our friends and family in this Christmas season as they are traveling and to keep them safe. And God, every other prayer request that we lift up now silently. But God, even in the middle of this trying time, we know that there is much to be thankful for. For life and for health, for food on our tables, for roofs over our head, for jobs to go to, for our friends and families, that even though we may not be able to be with them the way that we want, to know that they're still with us. God, let us never take these blessings for granted. But above all, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, your son whom you sent into this world on Christmas morning, that you brought salvation to this earth and you invite us to be a part of your story. So hear our praise and hear our prayers this morning as we now pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Let us continue worshiping God together this morning as Michelle uh, leads a special piece for us this morning.
the babe inside and I wonder what I've done Holy Father you have come and chosen me now to carry your son This time is time for our children's lesson. I know we have a couple kids here. If y'all want, y'all can come sit up here. Mr. Brent has a story for us, and he's got some props, I think. Uh, any children online, this is also the time for us to gather together. Uh, Mr. Brent has something to share with us.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. Well, this morning I thought, what if we played the what if game? And the what if game is, what if you wanted to be like the shepherds that saw the baby Jesus? Okay, now, if you're going to be, if you were going to be like a shepherd, maybe you'd have to know how to ride a camel. You know, maybe if they're going from town to town, maybe they had to ride a camel. But I know for sure what they did is they walked. They walked a lot. They had to walk because they're, they're sheep. They had to make sure where their sheep were their, so that none of them got away and stuff like that. So they did a lot of walking all over that field. But these shepherds worked during the day, and it was hot. So if you were going to be a shepherd, you'd have to have something on your head to protect you from the sun. But they also, they also had to work at nighttime. So they probably had a big coat or a blanket because it got cold. They're always working day and night. And if you were going to be a shepherd, you needed to know how to count. Oh, yeah, shepherds had to count because let's say they had 30 sheep. They're always counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're counting to make sure they had all their sheep. Now, if they didn't have all their sheep and one was missing, they had to go look for it. So they would get, they would take a big stick or a staff like this, and they would take it with them as they're looking for their sheep because maybe there was a wolf or a coyote trying to get one of their sheep. So then that shepherd had to chase that wild animal away. And let's say it got cold at night. And but you know, the most important thing that a shepherd could do, if you wanted to be like the shepherds that saw the baby Jesus, if you did, you would have to know how to talk. Oh, yeah. These shepherds, the most important thing they did was talk. And they talked about the time that they saw the baby Jesus in a manger. And this is what they would do. I'll say this is very important. The shepherds talked about one night, they're out working with their sheep in the fields, and an angel came down. An angel came down, and it was a real bright light, and they were, they were a little bit scared. Oh, my goodness. But the angel said, hey, you don't need to be afraid. You need to be happy because something miraculous happened in the town of Bethlehem. Yeah, in the town of Bethlehem, something happened. The baby Jesus, the son of God, was born. And then there were more angels came down. There was like a bunch of them, and they're all so happy talking to these shepherds about this. So then in a little bit, the, the angels went away, and then the shepherds were talking. You know where we're going, don't you? We're going to Bethlehem. So they started walking to Bethlehem. But they remember what the angels told them, that it was going to be a baby in a hotel, in a house. Nope. That baby, you could find it in a manger, kind of like a barn. And there's going to be a mom and a, there's going to be Mary and Joseph were their parents, was Jesus' parents. So they went to Bethlehem and they looked, and sure enough, that's exactly what they did. They found baby Jesus, the son of God, in a manger. And they told Mary and Joseph about the angel. So, boys and girls, if you want to be like the shepherds, you can tell that story. Because this story was told originally by the shepherds. And you know what the shepherds did? I said they talked a lot. They told their friends. They told their family. And their friends and family, they told people about this great story about when Jesus was born. And now Mr. Brent is telling you guys this story about baby Jesus and him being born and the angels. So if you want to be like the shepherds, tell that story to your friends and your family. Okay, let's pray. Put your hands together. Dear God, I thank you 
for the shepherds that like to talk and tell the story and share the story about when baby Jesus was born. Amen. 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 Have a good week, boys and girls. Thank you, Mr. Brent. This time as Caleb comes back to play a piece for us to center our hearts and to still our minds before we hear the scriptures read and the word preached. This is often the no normally the time where we re receive the morning's offering. If you're with us in person and you would like, you can leave an offering in the basket by the door on your way out this afternoon. Or you can go to magnoliaumc.org and click the donate button and leave an offering there. Same if you're online. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your faithfulness during this time. If you also, ha if you have your Bibles, if you would like to turn to Luke chapter 2, uh, we're going to read four short verses here in just a moment after Caleb centers our hearts. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, we're going to pick up where we left off on Christmas Eve. We'll start with verse 17 this morning. When they had seen him, the shepherds, they spread the word concerning about what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Christmas is over. Christmas is over. The garbage can was full of wrapping paper and bows and an obscene amount of cardboard. I'm not sure if we bought gifts or cardboard boxes for our kids for Christmas. The tree sits forlorn and lonely in the corner of the living room, empty underneath. If you have a real tree in your house, you may have more needles on the ground than actually on the tree at this point. The stockings are empty, and the kids are looking depressedly at the calendar, realizing how far away Christmas is now. Christmas is over. Or is it? In Christian churches around the world, Christmas Day is merely the beginning of the season of Christmas. There's the whole 12 days of Christmas thing to observe. It starts on Christmas Day and ends on Epiphany, which we'll celebrate next Sunday. Technically, Christmas doesn't end until January 6th every year. We're just in the beginning of Christmas, but Christmas kind of feels over, doesn't it? 
already if you go to Target, their seasonal area, which just a few days was overflowing with Christmas decoration and gifts and trees and everything else that you would need for Christmas. Already it's getting ready for Valentine's Day. Next week in several churches, pastors and worship planning staff will be turning their attention to Lent and to Easter morning. We make this big to-do about Christmas, but then before you know it, Christmas is done. We take one day a year to really celebrate Christmas, but I wonder if we're missing something when we in our society and in our churches hurriedly rush from holiday to holiday. What should our response be to Christmas? There's a part of us, I think, that wants to linger beside the manger. Christmas is beautiful with all of our decorations that are meant to remind us of the simple beauty of the first Christmas. The first Christmas with an angel proclaiming the good news to shepherds in the field with heavenly choruses and wise men with gifts and Mary and Joseph looking at their newborn son, Jesus Christ, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. There's a part of us that wants to stay there beside the manger as joy to the world and silent night, holy night plays in the background. It's comforting, that scene. And it requires nothing of us but to come and see. But imagine, if you will, if the shepherds had just decided to stay there beside the manger. The angel tells them about the birth of Jesus Christ. They hear the angel choir singing in the heavens, singing praises to God. They leave their, their flocks in the fields. They go and they find the Messiah child, just as the angel said. They marvel, they praise God, and then they stay. They just linger forever beside the manger. Has anyone ever had a guest overstay their welcome? They just don't know when to go home. <clears throat> One of my favorite Christmas movies is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's a classic. I look forward to it every year. It does a hilarious job of showing the stresses when the, ho- when the relatives descend on your house like a plague for Christmas. And when cousin Eddie the least welcome member of the family shows up in his rusty RV with his family and out of control Rottweiler and casually drops that they'll be leaving sometime next month. Clark Griswold practically chokes on his eggnog. Benjamin Franklin said fish and visitors stink after three days. Imagine if the shepherds didn't leave. Mary has to feed the infant Jesus, and the shepherds are still there. These random men just hanging out. Yes, they heard about Jesus from the angels, but they're still random guys, and they're still just hanging around. Joseph has to change Jesus' dirty diaper, and they're still there watching. Dude, go home. Don't you have flocks to look after? What are you still doing here? There's a temptation to want to stay beside the manger, but we aren't meant to. The other temptation that society offers us is what I've already kind of talked about, to rush from this holiday to the next, to the next, to the next. I had the realization the other night as I was putting together a Barbie house for my daughter and muttering things under my breath that in less than two months, the dude turns four. And we've got a birthday party to plan and more gifts to buy. Then there's Easter baskets, then Gemma's birthday, then Mother's Day, a 4th of July barbecue, back to school clothes, Izzy's birthday, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Jackie's birthday, and before we know it, dear God, it's Christmas again. We can get caught up in the distractions of being busy and rushing here and rushing there and buying this and doing that and that we can't really pause and we really just take a moment to just be. 
For some, that's what they want. They fill the void that can't be filled or they try to with busyness so they can try to ignore the emptiness. For others, the busyness, emptiness, till we can't remember what it means to be full in the first place, we aren't meant to live like that can't linger beside the manger forever, and neither are we meant to rush past it in a hurry on to the next thing. In the four short verses we read this morning, I wonder if we're given a glimpse instead of how we are to practice Christmas and maybe life itself. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them, we read. The shepherds did leave their flocks in the fields that night. They did go and find the Christ child just as the angel told them. I can't help but imagining them kneeling and praising God, that they got to see with their own eyes the promises of God made real. It's one thing to hear the prophet's words echoing across the centuries about the coming Messiah, but it's another thing to see him with your very own eyes. This was the Messiah that they were looking at, and I wonder if one of the shepherds asked for the chance to hold him. Arms that had held countless baby lambs in his arms, but wanted for just a moment to hold the Lamb of God for just a second. God had come close to them. I imagine they lingered briefly, but then they went. They went not straight back to their old lives, not straight back to their flocks, but first they had to tell someone, anyone, everyone about what they had seen and what they had heard. They had to share what the angel had said and how they had seen with their very own eyes everything just as the angel said it would be. God has come close, friends. They say, this day the Messiah has been born. God is doing something new. It's a new chapter in the story of God, and everyone who heard them marveled. They were amazed. These were shepherds. They're supposed to be in the fields, but here they are talking about angels and the glory of God and how the Messiah, the Savior, has been born. And I wonder how many people who heard the shepherd's testimony that night went to see for themselves. How many believed because what the shepherd said that the Messiah had indeed been born. The shepherds didn't linger forever beside the manger, but instead they went and shared with everyone they met, everyone who would listen about their experience. These two short verses show the power of testimony. They had seen something that could not be kept secret or hidden or just for themselves. They realized that it wasn't just for them. It was like the angel said, good news for all people. They had a duty to share it. What's more, what they had seen and what they had heard, what they had experienced, they wanted to share it. When was the last time you wanted to share something that you've seen or heard with someone else? When was the last time you invited someone to come to church with us? Have we ever? The shepherds didn't linger forever beside the manger, but they went and took the good news to the people. But Mary? Mary had this to say, Scripture has this to say about Mary. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary didn't set out and immediately start planning Jesus' first birthday party or worrying about the next holiday or all the other cares and distractions of life. She was there in the moment, listening and watching closely, treasuring up and storing these moments in her heart because she knew that this was time she wasn't going to get back. She didn't want to miss anything. She knew that she was part of something special. And while she didn't understand completely what this new chapter of God's story, what it was that God was telling, she knew that it was only the beginning. And she wanted to be a part of it. So she didn't rush past this moment headlong into the next. 
She stored up the moments and she pondered them. I wonder if we've taken time this Christmas season to really reflect on the meaning of Christmas. Have we stopped to examine our souls and our hearts for what difference Christmas makes in our lives and in the world? Have we looked for Christ with us? Because if we're too busy, if we don't take the time to treasure and ponder these moments, then we don't have a story to tell to the world. We don't have a story about why Christmas matters and how Christmas changes everything. If we don't realize the significance of how Christ came into the world the way he did and why Christ came at all, then we don't have a story to tell. Finally, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The shepherds didn't stop being shepherds. They eventually had to go back to their duties, but because they had had an encounter with God, because of the good news that they got to hear and got to see and got to share, they went back differently. That night was something they would never forget. Even though history has forgotten their names, their testimony lives on. Because of their testimony, maybe we're here this morning. They went back to the fields and back to their flocks with a song on their lips and a song in their hearts. They were changed men. Nothing in their lives after that night would ever really be the same. Familiar, yes, but not the same. Because when you have an encounter with God, when you meet the Savior, you're never the same. And nothing and no one could ever take that from them can't linger beside the manger forever, but neither should we rush right past it. This season is about God doing something new, starting a new chapter, telling a new chapter in the story of God, but the story does continue. Life goes on, but if we linger too long or rush too quickly, we miss the point of the story. We don't really understand what God is doing. If we stay too long or we rush right past and we don't really understand Christmas and our story is lacking somehow. God has given us each a story to tell the world with our words but also with our lives, with what we do. We are the only ones able to tell the story that God gives us. I can't tell your story and you can't tell mine. But God invites us all into the story of God and makes us together a part of God's story. And if we will let God, if we will accept God's grace that is freely offered to each of us, then God's story becomes our own. The presents have all been opened and the calendar moves us past Christmas Day to New Year's Day and beyond. But Christmas isn't the story of God with us has really just begun. So go, for just a few moments, go and tell the story of Christmas, of God with us, of God coming near. Go tell your story. Go tell God's story. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. As Caleb and our vocalist return to the stage, we're going to sing together again, Go Tell It on the Mountain. The story that we've been given, the story that we're invited into by God, the story of God coming near in Christ Jesus is not meant to be kept here inside these four walls. It's a story that needs to ring out into the world through every word we say, through everything we do everywhere we go. Go tell God's story. Amen.
Amen. Don't linger too long and don't rush past. But see for yourself that Christ has come close, that God is with us. And then go tell the story to everyone you meet, every way you can and everything you do. Go tell it on the mountain indeed. We'll see you next week. Go forth in God, in the grace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next Sunday. Amen.